Paul and Silvanus and Timothy under the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth so that we ourselves glory in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore, also, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith who shall establish you and keep you from evil and we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command you and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you. This we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. By all means, the Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Lord, 
make my life today a life of prayer that I may intercede for souls everywhere. Lord, give me a burden today for the lost on life's perilous sea. Help me guide them safely to Thee. Lord, help me, I pray. One sat alone beside the highway begging his eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his old rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. It's time to open the word once again with evangelist Lester Roloff on the Family Altar Program. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. The book of Hebrews, we find these words, chapter 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear. Now what are we supposed to be afraid of? Lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but... The word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Our Heavenly Father, we ask now that you'll furnish the proper mixture of faith and hearing so that the folks can profit tonight by the gospel that shall be preached. Dear Lord, bless every servant of the Lord. And Father, you know we've come to our lifeline tonight. This is our only hope. This is all we desire. This is all we ask of thee. And that is that you'd grant us the sweet privilege of living one day at a time by faith. With faith enough to say, give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. And Father, I ask thee tonight that you'll give to us a real service of faith. May the people lend their ears and receive the word of faith and may it find lodgment in a heart that's longing for Jesus. I pray that tonight will be that unusual time when dozens and dozens of people, even hundreds of people, will find the highway that leads not just to eternal rest, but to present rest and faith and trust and the overcoming portion. Father, bless the ones that are tired and weary, sick of body, disturbed of soul, upset in mind, and Lord, bless those that are bogged down in sin. I pray that this will be liberation night, Amen. emancipation night. Lord, I pray that even as over yonder in the book of Isaiah, you said, is not this the fast that I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burden, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Amen. Father, I pray tonight that you'll set your children free. Bless us with liberty and unction and power as we bring this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 The Bible is a book of faith and can only be understood as we believe. You can't understand the Bible by going off to college or going to a place of higher learning. The Bible is a faith book. And many times our intelligence and intellectuality and our knowledge and our training keeps us from believing the simplicity that's in Christ. That's the reason sometimes you'll find a man and they'll say, he's a brain trust, or he's a brain. He's really smart. I mean, he graduated with honors, and yet many of those people deny the truth that's in the Word of God. Not because the Bible is not an intelligent book. The Bible is, first of all, a book of faith. You only understand the Bible as you exercise the faith that God gave you. You don't work out the truths of the Bible. No man's smart enough to explain the Bible, but there's nothing unusual about that statement. If there's a doctor in the audience tonight, 
He can't explain the miracle of the physical birth. Now the Bible says four times, now the just shall live by faith. And yet James said, faith without works is ready for the undertaker. If you've got real faith, there'll be some works to go with it. Man said to me, think of this. What an ignorant statement. He said, listen, preacher, I believe in Jesus Christ just as much as you do. I'm just not a Christian. Why, that's silly. I mean, there's not a more stupid thing he could say. He believes in Jesus Christ as much as I do. He's got to be saved. Amen. I'm not going to stop there. If you believe in Jesus Christ as much as I do, and remember whatever faith I have, he gave it to me. But if you believe in Jesus Christ as much as I do, that kind of faith will bring some sort of spiritual action and reaction. And brother, you'll never have real action of faith, but what you'll get some reaction. The world will never understand you if you live by faith. The Bible said Abraham moved out of Ur of the Chaldees by faith. By faith, Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, and he was seeking for a city that had foundations, for here have we no continuing city. But he wanted a foundation that wasn't made with hands. Most everything we got in America has been made with hands. All that they've done, but dear friend, all of that's by sight, every bit of it. Folks, we're through. I mean, as a nation, our young people have failed to see Jesus Christ and a bunch of us adults, and they've turned to a bunch of poison. And that's the reason I've been trying to get you mothers and daddies during this revival meeting to give up your little play toys and come to God. And I declare to my soul, it looks like you'd rather go on the way you are than to ever have revival. I'm serious about this thing tonight. We've been playing at this task, and we've lost our generation of young people. See? People are just swarming across our nation without Christ and without any hope at all. They've not seen a living reality. I had an open uh, conference. The hand went up. A college student said, when was America happy? That's the question. I could tell he wasn't happy. I could tell the students were not happy. I could tell that they were just dragging through life and sort of pushing themselves through life. He said, when was America happy? My answer, when she was holy. I mean, when she was right with God. Our pilgrim forefathers, they lost half of their population in the new world, but they still had the Thanksgiving service. I know some of these modernistic idiots laugh at our Puritan forefathers, but I'll guarantee you they didn't commit suicide. They might have been killed by the enemy, but praise God, they didn't kill themselves. They had something to live for because they loved Jesus Christ. And if America was ever anything at all, it was made that because of believing people that honored God and believed in Jesus Christ and kept the Lord's Day holy. You know that so. You read your history book. You'll find out when America walked with God, she had a song in her heart. Her homes were not broken. Her children were not on acid. They were not on dope. They were not in juvenile shelters or jail houses. They had no psychopathic wards. They needed no psychiatrist. They were born at home and usually had a midwife to come, which was some good old godly neighbor woman. My mother served in that capacity most of her life. She never hesitated to leave her husband and three boys in order to go on the mission of mercy. The night was never too dark or cold. And the mud never too deep for her to ride one of those old mules of ours across the field and down those lanes until she saw the old lamp burning in the window. Brother, say what you please. We've never seen greater days than the days when people loved God and served God and lived for him. We wrecked our own ship and shot holes through the bottom of it with our infidelity and worldliness, and we've forgotten how to live by faith. I want to bear a personal word. Since the Lord called me to preach, I knew that if I ever made it, it'd have to be by faith because I didn't have anything on the human side to start with. Number one, I had no body. I mean, I had no physical body that could stand the strain that this body's gone through. The doctors announced it to me as calmly as they could and said, Lester, back to the farm, son, back to the farm. I was off to Baylor, had that old milk cow and uh, to milk my way through school. And I had no, I, first of all, I had no health. Second, I had no money. Third, I had no foundation on which to build in the way of an education. Now, brother, that's three big strikes. And you know when you get three strikes, you're out. 
I mean, it didn't seem there's any way on earth for me. And brother, let me tell you something. If I've ever made anything or done anything, it's been because of my heavenly attachment, my call faith. The Lord taught me. I couldn't understand it, but I got quiet about it. Didn't ask any questions. I went through school, and they said, you're not supposed to live by faith anymore. Yeah. You're not supposed to fast anymore. You're not supposed. I mean, you can't take the Bible literally. They call it literally. They said this was for the Jew and this is for the Gentile and this is. And so when I came out of school, all I knew, I just supposed to win souls. I mean, they never did get that out of me. I knew that Jesus died for sinners. And that's one of the good things you can remember. And I tell you what, preachers, if you just stay with that one thought, God will just about teach you the rest of it. I mean, if you'll get out and quit hobnobbing with a bunch of old worldly church members and whining and dining and running everywhere with them and start fellowshipping, I mean, the best you can with lost people to win them to Christ and knocking on doors and let the saved alone, God will bless you and teach you some things as you go this and to win the lost people to Christ. Dear friends, faith, I thought coming to church tonight as I rejoiced in the Lord and talked to him and praised him and he spoke some things to me this poem when nothing whereon to lean remains and that's about it now when strongholds crumble to dust when nothing is sure but that god still reigns that's just the time to trust tis better to walk by faith in this path of yours and mine in the pitch black night when there's no outer light that's the time for faith to shine Amen. folks there's never been a night and there's never been a day when it was so good, looked like for God's people to launch out by faith as it is right now. I mean, there's nothing that's going to convince. I said to my wife, when I, she and I were talking in, in the living room as we had our devotion, and, and, and she said, honey, do you know my favorite verse on faith? And I said, no, what is it? She said, it's in Romans chapter 14, verse last. And I said, what does it say? She said, anything that's not of faith is sin. Did you get it? Now, that means anything that's not done by faith is sin. Now, connect that with Hebrews and turn with me quickly, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And we'll pause in chapter 10 and come just as quickly as we can into the 11th chapter. He said, verse 36, for you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. In other words, after you've done the will of God, and this is one of the, and I started to say trick, but there's no trick to faith. I don't like for these people to talk about the magic of faith. Brother, man lives by faith is not a magician. It's real. I mean, after I see dollars come in every day for year after year and day after day, I don't believe that's a trick. I believe that's God. I don't believe that's luck. I believe that's the Lord. I believe the Lord is just as able today and willing today to make bear his mighty arm if he can get somebody to believe his word. And so he said, uh, after you've done the will of God, nothing happened. Why, sure, there's a little waiting time in there. Did you know that? He said, you need patience after you've done the will of God until the promise. You've received the promise. In other words, till you've had the fulfillment. The Bible said, when you pray, believe that you have it and you shall receive. He said, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believe him, you see. And if you and I, why Jesus said one day, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? You know what they'd uh, had trouble about? They found a little epileptic boy and they just thought, well, that's a simple case. And they walked over there. And brother, the power of God had departed from them and they were embarrassed and the little boy just kept on having epilepsy. I mean, he just stayed in the seizure and watered around the dirt and the daddy said, well, I brought him to y'all. And fellas, I understand. And I think they stumbled and stuttered and said, but well, ordinarily we could. I mean, this is rather unusual. Yeah, sure was. But I tell you one thing, when Jesus came down off that Mount of Transfiguration and he found them, he, he, he rebuked them and then said, bring him unto me. And then they said, why could not we cast him out? And he said, because of your unbelief. Why is this such a devil possessed generation? Because of the unbelief of Christians. Who's to blame? Is it the liquor traffic? Not on your life. Is it the acid takers? Not on your life. Is it the unsaved people? Not on your life. Who, who could be to blame, dear friend? It'll have to be the people that say they believe in the Lord and profess it and don't practice it. We'd have to be to blame. I mean, starting with me, all of us, we're going to have to confess our sin. They said, well, why could not we cast them out? Because of your unbelief. How be it, he said, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now then, the 11th chapter of the gospel of Hebrews. This is the gospel of faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. 
By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. When you get through reading the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and you look at all the faces of those precious saints of God that were hung on the walls of faith and the walls of fame, so far as spiritual fame is concerned, you've seen men who literally jeopardized and literally gave their lives by faith. The Bible said, look, read the 34th verse, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn asunder, tempted, slain with a sword, wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, afflicted, tormented. The world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, dens, caves of the earth. These all having obtained a good report. How? Through faith received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Brother, that was back in the day when they could trail the Christians by the blood in their tracks. They were invincible. They were unconquerable. They were inexhaustible. They were incomparable. There wasn't a thing on earth could stop them back in those days. Coming on to church tonight, I said, Lord, it seems we're in the wilderness without a Moses. I mean, we faced the Jordan and the walls of Jericho without a Joshua. I mean, we're in the land of Gadara, and I don't see the boat a coming. We're running it loose in the tombs of denominationalism and heresy and modernism, and it doesn't look like Jesus is going to show up. I mean, it seems that we're in the lion's den, and we lost the key to the jaw. It seems that we're in the fiery furnace and the fourth man is not present. I mean, that's about where we are right here tonight. We're living in a generation of insanity because we're in sin. And the churches have gotten adjusted to it and have measured themselves by themselves and denominations have said, well, I'm not any worse than somebody else and we've still padded our report and we've increased in number, but the whole thing's caving in on us right now. Right. Our teaching program, our Sunday school program, our training union program, the missionary program, and everything has failed because we tied it on to man instead of to God and the Word of God, and we decided to do it by sight instead of by faith, and the Holy Ghost of God flapped his wings and flew away and left Ichabod stuck on our door. I'm not trying to picture a thing that's not there. I'm just simply saying, if we want revival, we can have revival. I haven't got any patience with these people that run down the church and say, if it be thy will, send revival. If it be thy will, save lost people. Well, dear friends, I'll tell you what, God will never listen to a stinking, puny, sorry, faithless prayer like that. In the first place, you've misjudged God, and you've accused God of not caring and not having any will to save people from sin. You've said to God, I don't believe you're even willing to get one of your children that's had the breath knocked out of him by the devil, had a head-on collision with the world. I don't believe you love your child as much as I love my little child. If he got run over in the street, and I came upon him, and I looked at this dear man with that precious little girl, and her little face had turned blue, and blood was running out of her little ears, and she couldn't breathe, and he was screaming. His wife came, and I said, is it your will that breath be put back into her? Why, dear friends, I'd never ask a stupid question like that. We're living in a time when the breath has been knocked out. And when I say breath, you know what I mean by that? The Holy Spirit's been knocked out of us. We've absolutely grieved the dove away from our door, and we're trying to operate this thing with a hand crank, and she won't go. Now, we can, we can jack up the hind wheel if we want to, but she's not going to fire as long as we don't have some fuel in the engine. And the main thing, we've got to have an engine in the car. And so faith is the thing that brings life. I want to tell you about faith tonight. First of all, I got saved by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. There's not a person in here saved except you got saved by faith. Everybody gets saved the same way. They're not in the Baptist way or Methodist trail that leads to heaven. It's just the faith trail. By grace are you saved through faith. Now, these three thoughts came to me on the way to church. My soul is saved by faith. My soul has been cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ, regardless of what folks say about it or life about it. My soul has taken the plunge. Now, second, my body has been redeemed by 
faith. I believed the Bible. Therefore, the Lord said, well, this is the way you're supposed to live. So I found the will of God for my life. It happened to be the ministry, preaching the word of God. And so my life has been saved by faith. Now, and this blessed thought came and refreshed me. It really did. And I praise the Lord for it. You know, when I get to thinking about the goodness of God, it's not too hard for me to put on a concert for him. <laughs> I mean, the doxology just begins to flow. When you think about what God has done for you and, and uh, a long, busy day, and, and the Lord began to speak to me, and I said, and he said, Son, do you realize that you have the right exercise of your mind only by faith? Because God has not given you the spirit of fear, but the spirit of love, power, and of a sound mind. Amen. Dear friend, there is no victory apart from complete victory. Amen. There is no compromising victory. You've got to come to the place, and people say, Well, Brother Wolf, when do you know? And this is one of the questions that was raised, and that is this afternoon. They said, Brother Wolf, what are the repeats or the returns? In other words, how many of them return to the life of dope and liquor uh, that come? I said, not any of them that surrender to Christ as much as they surrendered to dope. When you get a Christian that's dedicated to God and to Christ and the Word of God as an alcoholic is to the bottle, I'll guarantee you, you've got one of the finest Christians you've ever heard of. Amen. You say, what do you mean? I mean, the alcoholic will first of all turn his back on his wife to get a bottle of liquor. He'll turn his back on his little children to be in the liquor joint. He'll starve every member of his family to death. He'll lose his job. He'll spend every dime he's got. He'll give his suitcase away, all of his clothes except what he's got on. And then he'll write hot checks and forge other people's names. Brother, he's dedicated to the cause of John Barleycorn. How long has it been since you met a Christian like that? How, how many hot checks have you ever written just because you're so burdened to give? Hmm? I'm not recommending that because I have gotten a few checks like that. And I'll say this, I never did file on anybody and I thoroughly enjoyed the gift until she bounced. <laughs> yes. Now the just shall live by faith, that's it. Four times, Habakkuk, yes. Romans, Galatians, Hebrews. Now the just shall live by faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. You know when the war is going to be over? It's when the Prince of Peace comes. I mean, when he puts the chains on old smutty face, the old devil, and said, you've had it, son. It's all over. It's all over. I'm taking over. You've been running your little train long enough. Now I'm taking up the rails. I mean, you're just fixing to have a real wreck right now, and I'm taking over. And brother, when Jesus Christ comes and rules, he's going to reign and rule, and we're going to have peace, and it'll run down like the rivers and cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's coming. You watch and say, we're not far from it, but man can't bring it about. You see, God's letting man do everything he can and then fail in everything he does. Man set up his little Tower of Babel many years ago. He pushed it over, said that won't work. And man set up his little uh, church program, denominational program, and even though I believe in the church, if it's redeemed and if God adds the members to the church, daily churches should be saved, but man's ruled God out of it, and he set up his educational program, ruled God out of it, and God said, all right, you can have it. And then we've got our little United Nations conference and said, well, we'll bring about peace by ourselves. We'll have our summit conferences and we'll meet at sea and we'll meet in New York and we'll meet here and we'll meet there and we're going to bring in the kingdom. But it didn't come in. And then we got the National Council of Churches and said, well, we're going to get all the churches together and all the denominations together and we're going to have union. And yet it hadn't gotten off the ground either. So you see, man will never work this thing out until he comes and surrenders and falls at the feet of Jesus Christ and said, Lord, take over. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord. And when he comes like that, then we'll have peace and we'll have joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Now the Lord taught me that I could live and I launched out. He said, I want you to live by faith physically, mentally, spiritually, and financially. I want you to live by faith. I mean, in all four ways, I want you to live by faith. Now, brother, don't you think that that's not, that scares the liver out of the flesh. I mean, the flesh just trembles and said it can't be done. And the flesh will say nobody else is doing it. And you're a fool for trying and all that. The flesh will scare you by day and wake you up at night in fitful sleep if it can because the flesh refuses to live by faith. And yet I've seen God's merciful hand. From that day until this rescue missions were born, Homes were born, the radio ministry was born, and uh, the, from a time, I was on a little 250-watt station when we first started on the radio. I stayed on it 10 months, and they gave me the boot. 
and off I went. And then I went the next day on a 50,000 watt station and I got two boots off of that one. Now, I'm not bragging except to say, brother, when you start to live in the faith, God will stay with you and he'll help you. And he'll, if you'll honor him by believing, he'll honor your ministry by rewarding it. Faith lives for somebody else, never for himself. I cannot, and that, that's a battle all of us are going to have to face and fight. You're going to say, well, what about my family? See, that's the trouble. What about my own interests? Dear friends, you're not to have any interests when you live by faith. They're all God's interests. <laughs> Did you let me tell you about that paper sack? I knew you wanted to know about that paper sack. A precious old soul who used to love us and send us gifts. And I decided to knock on her door one day. And I thought she'd never get to the door, but finally she did. And she said, who is it? Eighty some odd years of it. Who is it? She had a right to ask that. See, she'd been robbed, and folks had tried to rob her, and only the Lord protected her in an old two-story brick house on the corner. I said, it's Brother Olaf, the preacher on the family altar program. You've written me, and I want to come and visit you, and thank you for a gift that you sent. And she said, talk some more. <laughs> I said, this is Brother Olaf, and I'd like to talk with you and say hi to tell you. Just have a minute. And she opened the first door. And the second had latches all up and down it. And when she finally opened up to the screen part, I saw an old woman standing there and two of her best friends, Bonnie, and Charlie. Those were two dogs. And she said, uh, well, you talk like Brother Olaf, you come in. And so she opened up the door and she said, come in here. And I sat in an old fashioned room where there was some big, beautiful, look like drapes on top, you know, on the top of the big bed post that goes back over the bed. You've seen that, old fashioned. She sat me down there, and I saw the old-fashioned pump organ over there, some little carpets that she made on the floor. She finally said, you come in here. I went to the next room. I sat down, and she talked a little, and she was investigating me. And she said, you know, you are Brother Olaf. And I said, yes, ma'am. That's what I told you when I first came here. I knew it was Brother Olaf. <laughs> Yeah, but she said, I wasn't going to let you in till I knew you were brother. She said, you see, I've had people since my husband died. I've had people to try to rob me and said they've come here representing the utility companies and saying, we're going to have to check your wiring and all that you see. Oh, the thieves in a big city like Houston, Texas. She said, now you can come in the other room with me. And I went into the kitchen. And she reached down and took an old walking stick and took the crook of it and pulled out that paper sack. Now remember, we were pouring the concrete at the first city of refuge at Lexington, Texas. That's been years ago. And I'd called my friend Elton Brimberry and said, Elton, I wonder if you'd pour the concrete and get the foundation for us. We're building the place for alcoholics and narcotic addicts and then bill me 30 days later he said i'll do it and so he took his crew up and they poured the concrete slab i knocked on this lady's door at about this particular time she reached and got the sack and she said would you hold out your hand and i did and she reached in the sack and pulled out a 500 hundred dollar bill and another one and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. Now that makes six, doesn't it? That's $3,000. And uh, the paper sack wasn't empty yet. <laughs> and I wasn't tired either of holding my hand. It's amazing how much strength you can have under those circumstances. 
She reached her old wrinkled hand down in the sack again, and she came out, which had a one this time, and three zeros on the right of it. That makes a thousand. And she dropped it on top of the five hundreds. She reached in again and got another thousand and dropped it in my hand. And then she picked up a couple of one hundreds and dropped them in my hand. And she said, I may come to the city of refuge to visit sometime. If I do, I want something firm to stand on. She didn't know it, but we were pouring concrete that week. And I had the $5,000. I gave it to Mr. Bramberry and $200 left over. Dear friends, there's one thing God's convinced me of. He loves the people that are down and out. I mean, he really does. And he'll love and bless anybody in this building that'll get interested in precious souls. You see, any man, any man that's lost is helpless. A man that's an alcoholic is helpless. And nearly every alcoholic we've ever had to come to us, the main thing they needed was to be born again. Now, you can make loopholes, and I realize whatever, every church that I know of nearly has alcoholics in it or on the road. But I'll tell you what, I don't believe that anybody in here will have much trouble and many problems that you cannot solve, if any, if you ever get really, genuinely born again. Amen. I believe that'll solve your problems right there. Now, you can talk about what a good man and a good husband and everything else, but he's an alcoholic. Dear friend, he's a slave of sin. And I say again, if I took one drink of liquor once a year, I'd have every reason to question two things. First of all, my salvation and my divine call to preach. Right. Anytime I have to resort to anything that's poison and sour and rotted and that'll make a fool out of me and an idiot out of me, I do not believe that Jesus had a thing to do with it. Amen. I believe that's 100% of the devil. I'm going to have to say, when you really live by faith, you begin to live for him, and you have the victory. Oh, yes, God will give you the victory. Now then, turn to the book of Hebrews. Don't lose the place, the 12th chapter. Now, this is where we begin right here. I told you what happened to those people back over there. They were mocked. They were scourged, bonds, imprisoned, sawn asunder. I mean, cut in two, stoned, tempted, uh, slain with a sword. Uh, wore sheepskin clothes and goat skins and destitute, afflicted, tormented. Now, wait a minute. You'd say, well, Brother Wolf, that's all right for them, but let's read what he said. Chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, you know what he said? We're to live our lives exactly the way they live theirs, by faith. And if that brings the sword, let her come. If that brings the mocking, and it will. If it brings the scourging, and it will, either by actual lash or by tongue. Anytime you begin to live by faith, you rebuke the world about you. And the world will not stand under the rebuke of God's children by faith. And so I'd say tonight, if you and I are going to live by faith, there's going to be con constant opposition and misunderstanding from the world. But look at the bright side. There will be blessing and victory, and there will be power and uh, there will be accomplishments that you could never make in the flesh. Do you want to live by faith? The Bible said, now the just shall live by faith. I said, you got saved by faith. Now the Bible said, as ye therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him. Now, actually, he said, you're supposed to live after you get saved, just like you lived while you were getting saved. Now, how did you live while you were getting saved? In faith. The only way I knew in the world to get saved was just the preacher said, if you'd come and trust Jesus Christ, I didn't know that he'd save me, but he did. I didn't know that actually the promises of God were so because I'd never put them to the test. I came down the aisle trembling as a sinner and said to Brother W.A. Cockrell, I'm a sinner, I want to be saved. And he said, it, Lester, if you'll trust Jesus, he'll save you. And I said, I'll do it. The next Sunday afternoon, we waited off in an old tank. And I heard my mother and old J.B. Hale and many others singing, Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice 
and tell its raptures all abroad. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. It was a happy day, such a happy day, when Jesus washed all my sins away. And it happened by faith, just by faith. And then the next step of faith the Lord led me to take, and this was a big step, was to preach the gospel. And along with that was the step to trust him while I went off to school for two or three things. First of all, for, for provisions and enough wisdom to pass my grades. And that was a lot to trust him for. And yet, the Lord has been faithful, and he'll be faithful to you. Have you ever been saved by faith? I preached a meeting for one of my preacher boys many years ago, and uh, I went into the poorest community in that town. And uh, they had uh, a little old shack of a building, but I want you to know those working people full of sweat and dirt and work clothes, and here they came. Oh, what a crowd. I said, what a crowd. And night after night, the crowd grew until it was just like this tonight. They sat all over the platform. They sat on the steps, and there was an old man that'd come sit right here every night, and he'd watch me. He'd just sit and he'd watch me. Just as soon as I got up and started to preach, he'd beat it to my chair. That old man got it every night, just as sure as it was. Yes, sir. I mean, he knew he's going to have him a place to sit. But you know, the first night or two, there was a little boy came to the meeting. This is one of the sweetest memories of my life. And that little boy was barefooted and ragged, had on some little old overalls with the little galluses, and I don't think his hair had been combed in, well, a number of months. But anyhow, there he was. And, and he, I had what we call the booster band, you know, when we used to have the little booster band, and we'd sing, I have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Now, we'll forget we were singing, booster, booster, be a booster. Booster, booster. And the little boy got, he was singing, rooster, rooster, be a rooster. And he didn't know the difference. Didn't make a lot of difference in him. Do you know that? And uh, that little old boy came, though, and, and I, I kind of loved up to him. I don't think he'd ever been loved much in his life. I really don't. And when I, I remember the first time I kind of got him by his little galluses, you know, and it wasn't very heavy. And I kind of lifted him off of the floor like that. And I said, listen, what's your name? He said, and he couldn't talk too good. A little freckle face sort of a fella and had the lisping in his speech and I said, I sure like you. Boy, listen, that's all it took. You talk about a friendship, it was welded together. I guarantee you. That little old boy was the first one the next night he sat. And I never will forget the last uh, uh, Friday night of the meeting. I said, now, uh, tomorrow, that's Saturday, we're going to have an ice cream party. And I had a friend down at the drugstore, and he said, I'm going to give you 10 gallons of ice cream, and I want to come and dip it. And I'll furnish the cones. And so the next day, you know who the first one there was, don't you? That's my buddy. And beat it up to me, barefooted like you always. He said, Brother Olaf, let me and you have an ice cream eating contest. <laughs> I mean, he was setting the stage. He said, this is one time without money. I'll get some ice cream. <laughs> well, I said, Joe, we, we, we just don't. And directly, anyhow, you know who the first one in the line was. He wasn't trying to be rude. He's just a little hungry. And he got, and directly, so help me, he came to me. He said, Brother Olaf, I ate seven. How many you ate? <laughs> I said, Joe, boy, don't eat so many. You'll get sick now because we haven't churched. And oh, he said, I'll be there. And he was there too. The next morning, I spoke and in the early, in the Sunday school, and all the juniors were there. I gave an illustration. I talked to them about a watch and how to make it run if it stopped, and the plan of salvation. And then I pulled out 50 cents. And I said, folks, I've got 50 cents in my hand. And I said, I wonder if there's anybody here that believes me enough to come and get it. And you know who came, don't you? That's right. I mean, just like a streak, there he came, held out his little old hand, just like that. And it seemed like the little old hand was trembling. And I can almost see him now. He looked up at me just saying, Brother Olaf, you're not going to disappoint me, aren't you? Oh, listen, I guess never in his life that he had 50 cents. And I dropped what looked like a wagon wheel in his hand. And he looked up and said, thank you. And I said, that's yours for the rest of your life. And he walked to the seat and sat down. I said, folks, I'm not trying to get anybody to think that I'm paying you to get saved. But if you ever get saved, you've got to hold out your hand of faith just like that. And I said, I wonder why... The pianist plays into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. How many of you come? 
You know who the first one to come was. That's right. Never shall forget his little immortal statement when he said, Brother Olaf, I want to trust Jesus just like I trusted you. And I said, Joe, that'll get you in. And he held out his little hand of faith and received Christ Jesus as his Savior. That's not the end of the story. A few years later, this preacher had prospered and God had blessed him and, and he'd built, like he does everywhere he goes, a beautiful building. And he called me on the phone and said, Brother Olaf, it's ready. Will you come and preach the dedication sermon on Thursday night? And I said, yes, I will. I surely will. And so I went down and I sat on the platform and the new place was filled just like the old place was. Such a beautiful building and filled with pews. And he said, do you see somebody sitting there on the second row? And I said, yes, I believe I do. If I mistake not, that's a little old in it. I said, he looks so bad. Yeah, he said, he's been very ill. Almost crossed the river. When the service was over, everybody had gone. That same little weak, sickly boy came to me. And he said, Brother Olaf, I'm glad to see you. You know me? I said, yes, I do. I really do. And I put my arm around him once again, pulled him up close to me. And he said, you know, Brother Olaf, I've been real sick. And I thought I was going to die. And said, I don't feel good tonight. And uh, I think I can't get well. Will you do me a favor? And I said, Joe, if I can, I will. He said, when you get back on the radio tomorrow, he said, I want you to think I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Mm -hmm. Why, well, I said, Joe, I'll do it tomorrow and be glad to do it. The lights were off. The door was open at the side, and me and the preacher started walking up the road in the dark. And so help me. I heard some little feet come a pattern up behind me at high speed. And somebody said, and I could never mistake the voice, Brother Olaf, hold out your hand. And I hold out my hand, and he dropped 50 cents in it and beat it back down to the floor. Thank you for joining us today on the Family Altar Program with Lester Roloff. And they were blessed. He gave the weary rest. He made the blinded eyes to see. He fed the hungry soul, and he made the wounded whole by the waters of Blue Galilee. They sat at his feet, and they looked in his face, content in his presence to be, for no one before had cared for their souls like the stranger who sat by the sea.